I bring you a special greetings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the moment of revival. I want to assure you that the Lord is the creator of every human being. Permit me to make this preamble given our current situation before we get into the message of the day. God is the creator of every human being and is interested in every soul. The Almighty, the Creator God, is interested in the soul of every human being. And this earth was created for man, and of course the perfect will of God, taking a cue from what happened in the Garden of Eden. The perfect will of God is that man should live in a peaceful, stable, environment yes it god is interested in the total well-being of man we therefore need divine intervention divine intervention in the socio-political life of the humans he is the god of justice he's a god of justice and as I look at the current situation globally, I see a global surge of abomination. A global surge of abomination. But I want to just read a long passage of the Holy Week about what happened in the Bible, especially um, something that happened in the city of Jerusalem and there was a city called a bloody city let me read out Ezekiel chapter 22 I'm reading from verse 1 the book of Ezekiel chapter 22 from verse 1 and from there I will now get into the specifics of our topic for today Ezekiel just go with me and read this long passage, Ezekiel chapter 22. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, I'm reading from verse 1, saying, Now, son of man, will you judge? Will you judge the bloody city? Yes, show her all her abominations. Then say, thus say the Lord, God, the city shares blood in her own midst, that her time may come. And she makes idols within herself to defile herself. You have become guilty by the blood which you have shed, and have defiled yourself with the idols which you have made. You have caused your days to draw near, and have come to the end of your years. Therefore I have made you a reproach to the nations, and a mockery to all countries. Those near and those far from you will mock you as infamous and full of tumult. Look, the princes of Israel, each one has used his power to shed blood in you. In you, they have made light of father and mother. In your midst, they have oppressed the stranger. In you, they have mistreated the fatherless and the widow. You have despised my holy things and profaned my Sabbath. In you are men who slander to cause bloodshed. In you are those who eat on the mountains. In your midst, they commit loveness. In you, men uncover their father's nakedness. In you, they violate women who are set apart during their impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lovely defies his daughter-in-law. Another, in you, violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you, they take pride to shed blood. You take also and increase and increase. You have made profit from your neighbor by extortion and have forgotten me, says the Lord God. Behold, therefore, I beat my fist at the dishonest profit which you have made and at the bloodshed which has been in your midst. Can your heart endure 
Or can your hands remain strong in the days when I shall deal with you? I, the Lord, have spoken and will do it. I will scatter you among the nations, despise you throughout the countries, and remove your filthiness completely from you. You shall defile yourself in the sight of the nation. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. They are all bruised, thin, iron, and lead in the midst of a furnace. They have become dross from silver. Therefore, thus say the Lord God, because you have all become dross, therefore, behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As men gather silver, bronze, iron, lead, and tin into the midst of a furnace to blow fire on it. Now, because of our time, let me move to verse 23. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, say to her, You are a land that is not cleansed or ran on in a day of indignation. The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion, tearing the prey. They have devoured people, many widows in her midst. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy thing. They have not distinguished between the holy and unholy, nor have they made known the difference between the unclean and clean. They have hidden their eyes from my Sabbath, so that I am profaned among them. Her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Her prophets plastered them with untempered mortar, seeing false vision and divining life for them, saying, Thus say the Lord God, when the Lord has not spoken. The people of the land have used oppressions, committed robbery, and mistreated the poor, the needy, and they wrongfully oppressed the stranger. Now verse 30, So I sought for a man among them, who will make a wall, stand in the gap before me on behalf of the land, that I should not destroy it. But I found now, therefore I have poured out my indignation on them, I have consumed them with the fire of my rod, and I have recompensed their teeth on their own head, says the Lord. From this passage, a passage of a bloody city, they were doomed for destruction, but for his intervention. Instead of destroying, God said, and I sought for a man. And that's what the Lord is actually looking for. Currently, we need divine intervention. We need divine intervention in our nation. We need divine intervention in our nation. We need divine intervention in the socio-political concern. Economically and otherwise in this nation. We need divine intervention. And so, there is need for watchers. There is need for gap fillers. There is need for men who will stand at the gap asking the mercy of God that we might not be consumed by the inferno that is currently going around. Divine intervention. Let men and women, I call on the church, I call on people of God, stand on your knees. I mean, be on the guard. Seek the Lord. Ask for His intervention. Now we shall not be destroyed. That He will not pour out His indignation. Now, we, it's just a comment that I want to make. We'll be on our knees. Don't be careless about it. Don't say it doesn't concern me. You are not an accident. You are not here by accident. Yes. You are here by divine design. And just before you go to heaven, just before you are no more, until Jesus comes, you will be here. And you need an environment that is sanitized. Bow your heads in prayer. Father, we give you the glory and we give you the praise. We pray that you open our eyes to understand the mysteries in your world. In the name of Jesus. Amen and Amen. We started last week talking about, I asked you a question, what kind of conscience do you have? And in continuation of that series today, I'm looking at a move 
from dead conscience to living conscience. Dead conscience, moving from dead conscience to living conscience. You know, I, I ask the question, why is it that some criminals, they take hard drugs before getting into an operation? Why there are some people who commit abominations? They, you know, they, sometimes they, they want to get drunk so that they will not be normal while committing such abominations. In other words, they will want to suppress their conscience, dim the conscience, make the conscience, violate the conscience, make the conscience weaker and almost extinct, put to extinct the voice of the conscience. But today, I see God is going to do something in your life, in the life of every listener today. I see a revival, a great revival from dead conscience to living conscience. Reviving a dead conscience requires a cooperation with a spirit of grace and supplication. There has to be a yielding to the word of God. And this yielding must result to repentance. And this repentance leading to the purging of the soul from dead works. And then the soul being positioned to serve the living God. I just want to draw your attention to two passages of the Holy Writ. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 14, and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Hebrews 9, 14. The Bible says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience, from dead works to serve the living God. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Now, if you go also to chapter 10 of the same Hebrews, verse 22, the Bible said, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our heart, our heart, sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. I want to say to you today, weak conscience can be activated and strengthened by constant training of the soul in righteousness and in enlightenment in God's word. Training, enlightenment in God's word. It can handle the dead conscience. But when we talk about living conscience, a living conscience is a conscience that is, you know, a, a brand of conscience that can be described as tender, sensitive, and good. David is the most striking example of that conscience. And I want to draw your attention to 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. You will see what actually happened in 1 Samuel Chapter 24, look at the Davidic example of this conscience. First Samuel 24, I'm reading from verse 4. Then the man of David said to him, This is the day when the Lord said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as he seems good to you. And David arose and secretly caught up a corner of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterward, verse 5, emphasis, it happened afterward that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord anointed, to stretch up my hand against him, seeing he is anointed of the Lord. So David restrained his servants with this word and did not allow them to rise against Saul. And Saul got up from the cave and went on his way. David also rose afterward, went out of the cave, called out to Saul, saying, My lord the king. And then Saul looked
looked behind him, David stood with his face to the earth and bowed down. This is very, very interesting. You are aware that Saul was pursuing David. But let me put it in a normal line. It came to pass that Saul came to an unfortunate situation where a normal man will say, Wow, this man has come into my trap. He has fallen into my trap. Now, advisors, people who were with David told him, Wow, they even quoted the, 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 they said to him, This is the day which the Lord has said, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as he seems good to you. They quoted this, the ginger David, the water David, he arose. Oh my God. He caught a part of his skirt. Mere cutting of the clothes. He caught just the cloth of the man that had been wanting to swallow him. A man that had been wanting to eliminate him. A man that didn't want him anymore. A man that wanted to kill him. He had the opportunity. He had the opportunity to strike. One strike and he will die. One strike and he will elim be eliminated. Now, mere cutting of his skates. Mere, I use the word, mere cutting of his skates. The Bible says, <laughs> Now, let me, let me read it in some translations. It says in King James Version, it says, David's heart smote him. The New International Version, in that place, said, David was conscience stricken. Then, in, 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 in New King James Version, the Bible said, David's heart troubled him. Now, look at what New Living Translation says, David's conscience began bothering him. David's conscience began bothering him. Began bothering him. Bothering him for what? Bothering him that he just touched a mere skate of a man that is against him. What an example of a man we live in conscience. And my mind goes again to the same David. In second summer, when the Bible says that he, you know what he did when he sinned against God in second summer chapter 12? I just want to draw attention to you. When the man of God, you know, when David killed Uriah, the man of God went to him and said to him, gave him an illustration, and after giving him an illustration, David was angry over that kind of thing that happened. And something happened. Nathan, when David will say, bring the man who did such a thing, he will be destroyed. He will go for what he did. But, immediately, the man of God told him, thou art the man. David said to Nathan, I'm, 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 I'm looking at living conscience. He said to him, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord, the Lord has also put away your sin. You shall not die. Living conscience. Living conscience. Let me leave David alone. Get back to Judah. They gathered they gathered, they were planning against Joseph and how to eliminate him in the book of Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 39 verse 26, Genesis 39 verse 26, look at what somebody with a living conscience said. In Genesis, look at what he said. In Genesis 37 verse 26, sorry, 37 26. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? What profit is there if we kill? Can anybody say this from among the plotters? Can anybody say this from among the killers? From anybody say this from among the kidnappers? 
Is there something going on now? Are you a member? Are you a member of any gang? Are you a member of any 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 any, any plot 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 team? Are you in the kidnap? Are you among the kidnappers? And you want to waste blood? You want to kill? You want to shed blood? You want to eliminate somebody? Can somebody speak out? Can somebody speak out like you that? What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Is there any plan? Is there any plot that the devil unfortunately made you a part of? If you have a living conscience, you got to speak out, even from among them. Let me leave a move to Joseph. Joseph refused to violate his conscience against the ventures of Potiphar's wife. It's a sign of a living conscience. If you look at what he said in Genesis chapter 39, verse 9 to 10. There is no one greater in this house than I. Nor has he kept back anything from me. But you know, because you are his wife, how can I do this wickedness and sin against God? So it was as he spoke to Joseph day by day that he did not heed her. To lie with her and to be with her. He had a very good conscience, functional conscience, a living conscience. Look at Daniel's resolve not to defile himself with the king delicacy. It's a sign that his conscience is or was functional. In the book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 8, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego preferred to be roasted alive. They prefer to be roasted alive to violating their living conscience in Daniel chapter 3. That's a living sign of a living conscience. Let me, let me share with you before we round up symptoms of a living conscience. Like a watchdog, it often barks to scare the soul away from sinful conduct. Let me repeat. Like a watchdog, a living conscience bars to scare the soul away from sinful conduct. And number two, like a smart referee. Like a smart referee, an articulate lion's man. A living conscience blows the whistle and raises the red flag each time we commit a foul play or when we are offside. Just like a smart referee, a lion's man will blow the whistle, raise the flag, anytime you commit a foul play or when you're upside. I want to tell you today, living conscience cannot permit you to sleep with an unconfessed sin. It will not allow you to be angry till the fall of the sun. No, 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 no. You cannot sleep with the poison of bitterness and wickedness if you have a living conscience. You cannot sleep. You can't sleep with the poison of bitterness and wickedness if you have a living conscience. And a living conscience does not entertain any opinion contrary to the truth, purity, and dignity. A living conscience is a moral disposition that is framed by clear understanding of the Word of God and what the Word of God says. And you live by them. You live by the Word of God. Having a conscience requires daily response to the voice of conscience. What is God saying? I want to take you back to Acts Apostle chapter 24, verse 16. Strive always to keep my conscience clear. I exercise myself. I make sure I discipline myself to have a conscience void of offense. Towards God and towards man. Towards God and towards man. That's what the word of God says. That's what the spirit of God says. And I tell you, we have problems in society because people have problematic conscience. We have problems, we have abominations climbing here. We have killings because people have issues with conscience. I proclaim the message of Jesus. He's a life changer. I proclaim the message of Jesus. He changes lives. It doesn't matter 
how deep, terrible, deadly, dead your conscience have turned to be. I see Jesus renewing you. I see him renewing you, picking you. Now, let me ask you, are you a child of God? And there was a time when a little thing you do, you'll be restless, you'll be uncomfortable, you'll be sleepless. But lately, lately, you do those things you do, and you'll be sleepless and restless. You do them right now, and you feel okay. You feel as if nothing has happened. It means something is wrong with your conscience, something is wrong with you. You've dealt, violated the conscience, you've dimmed the conscience. It's as if it's no more speaking to you. But this is a moment of revival, a moment of revival. When you say, God, search me, God, revive me. I'm looking for personal revival. Oh, God, take me back, oh Lord. Take me back to that moment when my conscience will be really, really alive. I've told you symptoms. I've told you about great men, great men in the Bible who are living conscious. David caught a skate and you see what happened? His heart smote him. Judah said, what do we stand to gain by killing this, our brother, and concealing his blood? Many instances. I pray today for a great, great revival. Your soul Say, Lord, revive, revive my conscience. In case you're listening today, and you've been involved in all of those abominations, sometimes you get into drugs, hard drugs, to make sure no voice speaks to you when you're set to commit abominations. You drink, you get drunk, you get lost, you do things that are very abnormal. Nothing happens. I have a message for you. Jesus can change you. I know Saul the killer was transformed from Saul the killer to Paul the preacher. He had Damascus with experience. His life was transformed and changed. I bring to you good news that Jesus changes lives. He's willing to change you. It is not his will that will be in this manner. You'll be going round and round this dead conscience until you go to hell. The will of God is not for you to go to hell. He's a God of mercy. He's a God of grace. Where I read earlier, people that were supposed to be killed, people that were supposed to be eliminated, you know what the Lord did? He was busy looking for somebody who will stand at the gap on behalf of the land that he may not destroy them. God was not interested in destroying the land. No, 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 no. If he was only interested, he wouldn't be searching for men who would stand at the gap on behalf of the land, pleading that he may not destroy them. That shows the mercy of God, the mind of God, the heart of God for your life. His heart is not to destroy you. His heart is not to send you to hell. His heart is not for you to perry. It is to show mercy. It is when you strike, when you overlook it, when you just ignore, when you persistently ignore the mercy of God, the grace of God, that God will have no choice than to send you to hell. Don't say tomorrow, tomorrow may be too late. Don't repent when it is too late. No, 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 this is your chance today. This is your chance this morning to make peace with him. I see him stretching forth his hand and say, come on, come on. You are not meant for destruction. He wants to save you. He wants to heal you. Bow your heads in prayers. We give you the glory, Lord. Oh, right where you are, bless your hand on your heart. I say, have mercy upon me, O oh God. Have mercy, Lord. Have mercy that your grace will be released upon my life. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. He will do it. Tell him, have mercy. On me, O oh God, according to your love and kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression, my sins are before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. 
By the way, this is a prayer of a man with a living conscience. It's a prayer when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba and spoke to him. He fell before the Lord. Is that a praying? Can that be your prayer today? Can you pray the Davidic prayer? The mercy of God is available. Have mercy on me, O oh God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercy, blot out my transgression, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. I acknowledge my transgression. My sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. Don't this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak. I'm blameless when you join. I was brought forth in iniquity, in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward path, and in the hidden path you make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin, and blot out my iniquity. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take away your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your general spirit. And I will teach transgressors your way. And sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation of my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteous name. This is the prayer. This is the prayer. The Lord answer your prayer. The Lord show you mercy. The Lord show you grace. The Lord cancel your name in the book of death. Write your name in the book of life. Let there be restoration. The conscience that is no longer speaking. Oh God, restore unto him. Restore a living conscience. Conscience that will be alive. Conscience that will speak. Conscience that will be too tall in the word of God. Thank you, Father, for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, even for our nation, our country. We're asking for your intervention. Oh, Papa, we lift up hands. And I urge every listener, join me to lift up hands at this moment. Lift up your hand wherever you are. Say, God, intervene. Intervene in our nation. Intervene. Show mercy. Intervene, Lord. Intervene. 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 Only you can intervene. You are our final apostle. Thank you, Father, for answering prayer. We give you the glory and praise. Be that glorified. In the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Join us next week, this same time, the same channel, in this program, Moment of Revival. You can never remain the same. Never, never remain the same. I see the power of God, glory of God, feeling. I see you as God's ambassador of revival. I love you. We are praying for you. I am your brother, Chidi Okorafu. God bless you. In Jesus' name, Amen.